I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you all to this first in a series of, of lectures we plan over the next couple years probably on influential and powerful women in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And I want especially to thank the program in Women and Gender Studies for co-sponsoring this event and you for, for attending it. And I invite you to stay afterwards for refreshments and libations, nothing alcoholic of course, in the um, traditions room which is directly behind this and don't go over the balcony, go around it. <laughs> I'm also very pleased to, to introduce to you our first speaker in this series, Professor Marcus Cruz from the School of International Letters and Cultures at ASU, who has been described by more than one scholar in the world of medieval French studies as a clear leader who holds the promise of playing a profound role in the future of medieval studies, both in the United States and internationally. His scholarship positions him as one of the premier scholars of his generation. That scholarship is insightful, exciting, substantial, and in the case of his book, Manuscript as Monument, and his talk here tonight, very well illustrated. Since coming to ASU a few short years ago, Professor Cruz has positioned himself as one of the most respected and revered colleagues and teachers on campus, and it was his inspiring on-site lectures in Paris one summer that moved one of his students to recommend him and this new series to us. We're grateful to her as well. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Mark of Cruz, who's going to speak to us on how Christine de Pizan rewrote history. Well, uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Professor Bjork for that, as usual, very generous, if not over generous, uh, introduction. He really has a talent for that, by the way, putting speakers on the spot with this kind of praise. Let me also thank all of you for coming out. Um, I was just uh, at a conference in Oxford, and I can honestly say that uh, it was with real pride that I was able to tell people that I was meeting for the first time about the fact that I teach and work here in this community and with this kind of uh, a group of colleagues and students and people in the community who support medieval studies. We are truly fortunate here at Arizona State University and it's been a privilege to be here. Let me continue my thanks uh, to Bob and the ACMRS in particular by saying that I wouldn't be here uh, if it weren't for the ACMRS. Um, I received a faculty fellowship back in 07, 08, which allowed me to complete my book research, which allowed me to get tenure, which is why I'm still on campus. So thanks a lot, Professor Bjork. Thank you, ACMRS. Um, this is going to be a, uh, an interactive experience. This isn't going to be uh, it's not going to be 45 minutes of me talking at you. I'm going to ask you to look with me and talk with me about uh, what we see this evening uh, related to uh, Christine de Pizan. So let me start with an anecdote. Sometime in 1404, there occurred one of the most unlikely yet significant encounters in the history of Western literature. The meeting was unlikely because of the participants. On the one hand, Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, the son of King John II of France, brother of the French King Charles V, and uncle of the then reigning French King Charles VI. Philip ruled over Burgundy and Flanders and was one of the most ambitious, powerful, and feared princes of his age. This is Philip's tomb, and as its extravagance suggests, he was not a shy and retiring man. <laughs> he has a lion at his feet, he has a crown on his head, and he has these beautiful winged angels here who are singing him to sleep, singing his praises. And down here, the famous pleurant, the mourners. This tomb was made uh, several years after his death, and so the crown here reflects the pretensions of his Burgundian descendants who wanted to be kings, kings of Rome in particular, who wanted to rival their French royal cousins. His interlocutor, 
whom Philip had summoned to his palace in Paris, was a middle-aged widow and mother of three, a woman who was not even of the petty nobility. Making the visit even more unlikely was the reason for it. Philip wanted to personally commission this woman to write a major work of history and propaganda, despite the fact that up to this point in her life, this woman had enjoyed no great fame or distinction as a writer, and thus far had not produced any writing on contemporary politics at all. The work requested by Philip of this woman was none other than a biography of his brother, King Charles V, who had reigned in France from 1364 to 1380, who had restored the French kingdom after a series of natural, political, and military disasters, who already during his life had earned the sobriquet, the wise, and whose memory was greatly revered even a generation after his death. The result of this meeting, completed several months later by the widow, was a monumental biography that stands as one of the most important sources of late medieval history, as well as one of the most extraordinary works of medieval biography and political philosophy. The work in question is the book of the deeds and good conduct of the wise King Charles V. And the woman who wrote it, as you have no doubt guessed, was none other than Christine de Pizan. I begin with this anecdote because it illustrates several of the things that make Christine an exceptional figure in Western history and letters, a figure who was truly interesting and worth knowing about. For one, note how this non-noble woman nonetheless had entree with one of the great lords of her age. Clearly, she was very well connected. Notice that the prince conferred quite an honor on Christine by asking her to write about a man who was both his brother and a major national figure. He clearly had confidence in her abilities. Note that Christine not only did not decline the Duke's commission, but attacked it with relish and completed it in less than a year. She clearly had justifiable confidence in her own abilities. She also worked so quickly because she had to. Another noteworthy quality of Christine de Pizan is that she is, by most accounts, the first professional woman writer in European history. That is, she was the first woman to live solely off the fruits of her plume. This fact alone makes her worthy of study. For this presentation, I will briefly outline Christine's biography. I will then discuss the historical and cultural context in which she lived, and I will conclude by discussing a few of her major works and showing you several images from the manuscripts of these works. As my title suggests, I will show how Christine rewrote history. I mean three things by this. First, I mean simply that like all medieval writers, Christine borrowed from earlier sources although she did so in particularly creative and compelling ways. Secondly, I mean that Christine transformed the ways in which her readers encountered and understood the past. And third, I mean that Christine was herself a historically significant figure, someone who arguably helped change the very course of history. The quality of Christine's writing, the political power of her original audience, and the extraordinary design and sumptuousness of her manuscripts all elevate her to the pantheon of Western writers, male and female. Indeed, taken as an entire corpus, her writings and manuscripts make Christine a fairly incomparable figure. Few post-medieval authors, after all, have so attentively overseen the actual material production of their works and none have as rich a body of physical texts for which they are responsible. As we will see, this imaginative labor of manuscript production places Christine in a class of her own. So first, her life. And don't worry about keeping all of these dates in mind because I'm going to show you a slide with the chronology when I get to the end of it. So very quickly, Christine de Pizan was born around 1364 in Venice. Her father, Thomas, was a famous astrologer and doctor whom King Charles V of France invited to Paris. Thomas went first, shortly after her birth, 
and Christine arrived with the rest of the family in 1368. Around 1379, Christine was married to Étienne de Castel, a secretary at the royal court. The couple had two sons and a daughter between 1381 and 1385. As Christine herself mentions in several of her works, these events, the reign of Charles V, her life at the royal court, her marriage, her family, comprised the first happy chapter of her life. Between 1380 and 1389, however, this chapter came to an end. Charles V died in 1380 and was succeeded by his son, Charles VI, who was less supportive of Christine's father and husband. Her father died between 1384 and 1389, and then came the cruelest blow, the death of her husband in 1389. In her mid-20s, Christine was left with three small children a mother and a niece to care for. However, this is the moment when Christine's biography deviates from the norm. For most widows in this period either remarried or entered convents. Christine, on the other hand, resolved to support herself and her family by writing. She would attempt to cultivate the powerful people whom she knew through her court connections and to create a network of patrons on whom she could rely. As I noted earlier, this decision was indicative of her social connectedness and of her confidence in her abilities. But it was probably also the result of something that she expresses repeatedly in her writing, her love for her husband. In her works, and the voice certainly seems authentic, although we cannot know for sure, Christine speaks of her deep attachment to her husband's memory, describing her marriage more as a love match than as an arranged marriage. Her decision to support her family on her own suggests not only a strong-willed and capable person, but someone who could not imagine or did not wish to gamble on happiness in a new marriage. In the 1390s, Christine wrote lyric poetry and devotional works, but we know from her later work that she did so mainly because this is what her patrons wanted. It was a way into the literary marketplace. It was a way to start making money. In 1400, she began to write in what was for her a new way. She now focused on history, mythology, and allegory. Now, I realize that not everybody has taken a medieval literature class recently, so I remind you that allegory is the use of concrete representations or visible signs to represent ideas or abstract phenomena or absent personages. So a classic example of this is the Statue of Liberty, right? That's an allegory. Okay. Allegories may be very important for Christine. Christine's goal was to present to her patrons and audience the wisdom of the ancients in accessible form, since this would help them to be better rulers. She borrowed heavily from the counsel and narratives of ancient writers, but structured this matter in creative ways and imbued it with her own ideas about ethics, governance, love, and a host of other issues. Because of this extensive borrowing, Christine is at times criticized for being not an original writer. But this misses the obvious point that no medieval writers were original in the modern sense. And in fact, from a medievalist perspective, no author, even today, is ever original. Originality is an invention of romanticism and capitalism. Sometime around 1418, after the Battle of Agincourt, about which more in a minute, and the collapse of the French royal government, Christine seems to have stopped writing and gone to an abbey where her daughter was a nun. She wrote one last poem celebrating Joan of Arc in 1429, and she died between 1429 and 1431. Here's our recap. Born in Venice, moves to Paris, marries, death of Charles V, birth of her children, death of father and husband, lyric and devotional works, the beginning of her literary career, the major works, the first two decades of the 15th century, poem celebrating Joan of Arc, and her death at the Abbey of Poissy outside of Paris. The date, we don't know exactly, but we know it's between 20, 29 and 31 because the poem celebrating Joan of Arc is the last thing that we can attribute to her, and it is a celebratory uh, poem about Joan of Arc. In other words, it doesn't mention Joan's arrest and subsequent trial and death at the hands of the English. 
So most likely, Christine had died at that point. Otherwise, we would assume that we would have something else by her about Joan of Arc. Okay. In the centuries after her death, Christine retained a reputation as a learned woman, though she was at times belittled for the quality of her work, and more important, was seen as at best marginal to the history of French literature. It has only been since World War II that the true importance of her work has been appreciated, and there is today an entire field devoted solely to Christine's studies. This brings me to the second part of my talk. To fully appreciate who Christine was, we need to know not only these contours of her life, but the context in which she lived. There are, I believe, three factors crucial to understanding what made Christine the writer she was. The first factor is the city in which she lived most of her life, Paris. Christine was a proud Parisian, and it is no accident that Paris and other cities appear throughout her works. Paris in Christine's day was the largest city in Europe and capital of the Kingdom of France. The slide shows you the dimensions of Christine's Paris in relation to the modern city. As you can see, her Paris was the center of the city we know today. So can you all see what I've done here? I've taken this map from 1572, which I'll show you um, in normal proportions and close up in just a minute. I've overlaid it on a map of the modern 20 district Paris. You can see that what we're talking about is a very, very small part, the historic center, the kernel of modern Paris. Christine's Paris was divided into three parts that reflected the city's different inhabitants, functions, and symbolic meanings. So what have we got? We have the right bank, or the ville, this is north, this way, this is west. So the right bank, the ville, the merchants, the commercial center, curiously enough, the commercial center to this day. This is where the Bank of France is located. It's where most of the um, large department stores are located. So we see this wonderful continuity in the history of the city. Then we have the Ile de la Cité, which is where both the bishop over here, Notre Dame, and the king over here had their base. This is wonderful because they're literally squaring off on the Ile de la Cité. Can you see that? It's the two main kinds of power, terrestrial and spiritual, facing off in the center of the city. And then we have the left bank, which is the university quarter, and is the university quarter to this day, right? The Latin quarter, so called, because Latin was the language of learning. Okay. Under Charles V, the city had obtained new defensive walls, bastions, and fortresses. You see Charles V's wall right here. That's the wall that was built in the 1370s and 1380s. The wall that you see here was the wall of Philip Augustus, constructed 1190 to 1215. Most spectacular were the renovations of the Louvre under Charles V, which transformed the Louvre from a fortress into one of the most sumptuous and grandiose palaces in Europe. Here's where the Louvre was in Christine's day and here is the Louvre of Charles V, and the art historians in here recognize that this is a miniature from the calendar of the Très Riches Heures. This is where Christine probably spent much of her childhood, a noteworthy fact because it is easy to imagine that it was here that she acquired her understanding of the importance of aesthetics for projecting an image of power and knowledge. In other words, living at the Louvre in particular was like living in a constant royal theater. It was a place for the projection of the noble self, the royal self, and royal virtue and power. We see an echo of court splendor then in the illuminations, design, and fine parchment of her manuscripts, which I will show you momentarily. Paris was also a sacred center, known across Europe for its prestigious shrines and relics. The Cathedral of Notre Dame was the spiritual heart of the city and of the French kingdom a sign of France's devotion to the church and to the Virgin Mary, and a sign, too, of the church's power. Near Notre Dame, in the royal palace on the Ile de la Cité, was the Sainte Chapelle. This chapel had been constructed by King Louis IX, Saint Louis, to house relics of Christ's final suffering, his passion, relics including the crown of thorns and a piece of the cross on which Christ was crucified. This was one of the most famous religious structures in Europe, as it still is today, and embodied the notion that the king of France was the Rex Christianissimus, the most Christian king. 
Christine's later writing will return repeatedly to the idea that France is a blessed country with a special relationship to God, and her writing will constantly remind her noble audience of their religious duties. And we can see then how important it was to be near these shrines and imbibe this sense of the special relationship between France and the divine. A royal capital and sacred site, Paris was also renowned as a center of learning. Again, here was the site of the university. The University of Paris was the first European school to be constituted as a university, which is to say as an organization or a guild, if you like, of professors and students operating under papal, not royal or Episcopal supervision. In other words, the University of Paris was independent of both the king and the Bishop of Paris, which gave it great power to match its great academic prestige. Although Christine, as a woman, was not allowed to attend the university, the university's presence is felt everywhere in her work because it gave Paris one of the most sophisticated intellectual cultures in Europe. The university inspired Christine, it forced her to compete with learned men, and through the extensive book trade that it produced, the university enabled Christine to acquire the many texts she drew on to compose her own works. The second factor that shaped Christine's writing was the development of French language and letters. I remind you that in the Middle Ages, the language of the church and thus of the university was Latin. There is still debate about how well Christine knew Latin, but in any event, she wrote in French because she was writing for a lay audience that for the most part was not schooled in Latin. But this does not mean that her writing was considered inferior or was taken less seriously by her readers. French had been a literary language since the early 1100s. In other words, by the time Christine was writing, French literature had, de had been developing for 300 years, enriched by translations and works in a wide variety of genres. Christine's work reflects the breadth of French literature and translation. She draws on the Bible, church fathers, saints' lives, Greco-Roman history and mythology, Celtic matter, especially the Arthurian legends, French history and epics, Eastern lore, travel and crusade literature, encyclopedias, philosophy, Italian literature, notably the works of Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio, and lyric poetry. In this way, Christine is a product of the policy of translation and literary production that was pursued by her beloved King Charles V, here shown reading in his study in an idealized image from the French translation made for him in 1372 of the Polycraticus, a 12th century political treatise. Note the ways in which this image evokes the union between power, learning, sanctity, and nation. And now we come to the first part of our interactive evening. You tell me, what evokes power? The king wears a crown. And the finials, the sculptures on his uh, extraordinary chair, his reading throne really, are lions. And lions are a reference to what in regal imagery? They go back to the throne of Solomon. The throne of Solomon, which had 12 lions on it for the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? So power, uh, where do we have, okay, royal blue, that's good. Well, uh, now let's get to that then. Since, since you bring it up, that's excellent. Thank you very much for participating actively. <laughs> royal blue with what on it? Fleur de lis. Royal blue and the fleur de lis are gold. Who gets to wear that? King. Only the king. Those are the arms of the royal family of France. And when dynasties change, they get those coat of arms. And the lesser branches of those families will have quartered arms, they will have half arms, but that is for the king only. Very good. 
Where do we have learning? The books. Yeah, and notice we have books plural, do we not? Lots of books, a heap of books, in fact. And then there's one book that's open, and it looks like the king is doing what? Reading. So he is literate. That's exactly right. Also very interesting, if we could look at a detail of this, which we don't have time to do, but I could show you this, we would see that he is actually reading in Latin. And he's reading from the book of Ecclesiasticus. And the text that he's reading said, says, blessed is the man that shall continue in wisdom and that shall meditate in her justice. This is an Old Testament wisdom book. It's actually one of the apocryphal books of the Old Testament. But um, it was considered uh, standard and uh, authoritative in the Middle Ages. Where do we have sanctity? This is kind of hard to see. The crown, arguably, uh, fleur de lis, because it was said that that was given to the kings. But there's a detail that's kind of hard to see. Can you all see how there's blue up here? That's the sky, that's the heavens. And this is a hand. Uh, the hand of God. It's the right hand of God, and it's going like this. And this is a sign of benediction. This is the blessing sign in medieval iconography and uh, gestural culture. So the king is being blessed by God, even as he reads about the kinds of people who are blessed by God. Nation, well, we've already talked about that, right? We've got the royal arms of France. So I love teaching this image. This is one of the richest images of the 14th century for thinking about the role of propaganda in medieval manuscripts, for thinking about the cultivation of national culture, national language under Charles V. And this is one of many such images from the reign of Charles V. He was truly an extraordinary king, uh, really one of the first kings to reject the chivalric martial image and embrace an image of the learned, wise king to the full. Charles V also amassed a collection of 976 manuscripts that he placed in the northwest tower of his renovated Louvre. It's this tower right here. The Falconry Tower, it was known as. It is likely that Christine had access to at least some of these books in her youth. It is even possible that her exposure to this library, combined with her father's tutelage, gave her her taste and talent for reading and writing. In any event, it was the idea of French as a language of learning and power, and of Paris as the new Athens, new Rome, new Jerusalem, that Christine reflected in her writing. The third factor that shaped Christine's writing was the Hundred Years' War. Allow me to give you a brief overview of this conflict. It began in 1328, the last, male, the last direct male member of the French royal dynasty known as the Competians died in that year, it's Charles IV. Now, two men had a claim to the throne after the death of Charles IV. One of them was Edward III, King of England, and the other was Philip of Valois. The French nobility could not accept the idea of the English king becoming king of France. So they declared that Edward III was ineligible for the throne because he descended through the female line, whereas Philip did not. Okay, English grad students, quick quiz. The French invoked what law? Excellent, A plus, go to the head of the class. <laughs> Salic law, right? They said, oh no, French crown has never been passed on to the female, ha ha, right? This is ridiculous. And Shakespeare makes a lot of hay out of this, by the way. This is a wonderful scene in Henry V. Um, so this was, to say the least, a flimsy argument. And Edward III responded in 1337 by launching a war against France. This conflict would be carried on by his descendants until 1453. Major events of this war included the Battle of Poitiers in 1356, at which King John II of France was captured. And you all know from chess that that is the objective. You capture the king, and you have done a great deal of damage to a nation. John II was imprisoned in London for four years thereafter. There was a civil war between the Burgundians and the rest of France, during which the Burgundians sided with England. There was the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, the uh, climax of Henry V, the play, at which the flower of French chivalry was cut down. There was the fall of Paris to the English in 1422, 
There were the surprise successes of Joan of Arc between 1429 and 1430. There was the burning of Joan at the stake by the English in Rouen in 1431. There was the retaking of Paris by the French in 1436, which Christine did not live to see. I'm going to show you a couple of maps just to give you an impression of what was going on. So, in light purple, territory gained by England during the first decades of the Hundred Years' War. In green, territory that technically belonged to the King of France, but those were always very shaky alliances throughout the Hundred Years' War. And in particular, I want you to look at Burgundy. Do you see Burgundy? Do you see how it juts into the side of France like a knife? And that's what it was. It was a knife in the side of France. And that's why they've given it a different color and different outlines, because it was not allied, not in any sure way, to the kings of France. And then the end for the English. Here's what the English had gained. Quite extraordinary. And notice that it abutted Burgundy, right? That was all by design. And then eventually this is what was lost by the English in the last generation of the Hundred Years' War. Now, I emphasize the war's importance to understanding Christine for two reasons. First, the drama of the thing. Christine lived through some of the darkest days of French history. And it is easy to read her silence at the end of her life as either stoic detachment or despair or both. Yet it is also notable that her final work was a celebration of the victories of Joan of Arc, which she interpreted, like most of her French contemporaries, as the result of divine intervention. Now the second reason I mentioned the Hundred Years' War is that before she went silent in 1418, Christine belonged to a group of French writers and political leaders who undertook an extraordinary reassessment of French politics and military strategy. So let me ask you, what do you think prompted writers such as Christine de Pizan to re-examine the most fundamental tenets of government and chivalry? I'll give you a minute while I get my water. Any guesses what prompted this? They rethink everything. They rethink the army. They rethink the relationship between the king and his subjects. Yes? Uh, could it be because they were getting uh, trounced by the English? A plus. <laughs> That's exactly right. That really is the only answer, in fact. That's very good, OK? <laughs> so the simple answer, I was going to say they kept losing, but the gentleman actually puts it in much more appropriate terms. They kept getting their butts whipped again and again and again. It just didn't stop. It was calamitous. And so, as current scholarship points out, one reason, the main reason, that the French eventually won the Hundred Years' War, or at least they didn't lose the Hundred Years' War, right? They got their territory back, is that they learned from their mistakes. Disastrous defeats like the one at Agincourt led them to reform their military practice and political structures in ways that ultimately made them more disciplined and effective than the English. Christine, who wrote for the most powerful lords of France, had an important role in this process of restructuring, which led to the creation of a professional army and to the application of ancient codes of martial discipline. Christine is one of the people who really helps to bring back the Roman ethos of stoicism, sacrifice, organization in battle. Um, and we know this because of uh, the kinds of texts that she's writing, the kinds of people that are reading it, and then the kinds of reforms that we're seeing in this period. So uh, that is one of the most interesting aspects of her uh, writing and the influence of it. And it's only just now really being discussed in modern scholarship. This brings me to the third part of this presentation an examination of a handful of Christine's most significant works and manuscripts. My main goal here is to give you a sense of the interest of some of her writing, and equally important, to give you a sense of the beauty of the books in which her writing is preserved. I began with the story of how Philip the Bold commissioned Christine to write the biography of his brother, King Charles V. An obvious question that this story raises is how he knew who she was in the first place. The answer is that Christine had brought herself to the Duke's attention in the most direct way possible, by presenting him, his brother, the Duke of Berry, one of the greatest patrons of arts in the late Middle Ages, his nephew, the Duke of Orléans, 
and his nephew King Charles VI each with a sumptuous copy of what Christine considered her first serious work, the Epitre Otea, the letter from Otea. In this work, Christine invents a goddess of wisdom named Otea. The text is a letter that Otea writes to Hector of Troy, giving him advice on rulership, warfare, ethics, and devotion, among other things. This image shows Christine presenting a copy of this work to John, the Duke of Berry, who was the brother of Philip of Burgundy and of King Charles V. Let's analyze this image together for a moment. Where is Christine? Good, she's kneeling on the right, that's exactly right. And what is she holding? A book, that's exactly right. And who do you think this is? Well, that's a very fashionable man, man, man's hat, male hat there. This is the Duke of Berry. Here he is right here. Here's John, the Duke of Berry, very finely attired. You will notice that he is sitting under this baldachin that has the gold fleur-de-lis on a blue background. Hey, I'm the brother of the King of France. I'm the nephew of the reigning King of France. I get to use these arms. And then we see that he himself isn't reaching for the book, but one of his attendants is. So this is very interesting because the book itself is like the mediator, the intermediary between Christine and the Duke. And of course we see that there is a clear hierarchy that is established between the two. Were the, were the Limburg brothers involved with any of the illuminations at this time? Uh, this is their period, but not with this particular manuscript. Good question. This illumination is intended as a permanent reminder to the Duke that Christine has given him a gift and that she seeks his patronage. It is, in other words, a theatrical or performative image. It speaks for the author and is itself a sign of her humility and supplication. Christine herself could only present this manuscript once, but in the image, she is always presenting it. The image stops time and thereby amplifies and makes permanent her gift gesture and her request for patronage. So it's a very effective way of getting into the good graces of these powerful people, of getting herself into a serious literary market. This image also raises another question. Why would Christine imagine that the Duke of Berry, one of the most powerful men in France, would be interested in her work? The answer has to do with medieval understandings of nobility, rulership, and learning. Throughout the Middle Ages, there was much discussion about how much learning a ruler should have. The expression you see on the slide, an unschooled king is a crowned ass, something to keep in mind in our current political season, is it not? <laughs> became popular in the 12th century and reflects the fact that in the late Middle Ages, there was ever more emphasis on the need for rulers to have at least some book learning instead of just military training. Christine's letter from Otea offered a wealth of advice on topics considered crucial to being a good ruler. Virtue, vice, generosity, loyalty, the education of children, deception, valor, etc. In this way, Christine was placing herself in a long line of royal advisors and flattering her patrons into thinking that they were like earlier wise rulers. For example, Christine was drawing on ancient models, the most famous of which was Aristotle, who was the tutor of Alexander the Great. And this image is especially interesting for the medieval iconographers in the audience because this is Aristotle. But he's seated in a raised chair. He has a pileus, which is the cap of the university professor. And he also has a switch in his right hand, which is a common motif uh, attribute of lady grammar, one of the liberal arts. So this is a very rich image uh, associating Alexander's education to that of clerics, to that of people at the university. Christine was also drawing on more recent examples. The most revered member of the French royal line was Louis IX, or Saint Louis, who it was said had devoted a great deal of time to study and devotion. By supporting Christine, Saint Louis' descendants could feel like they were continuing in his footsteps, 
like they resembled their learned and pious forebear. Now, many people throughout the Middle Ages wrote texts offering moral and political advice. If that were all Christine had done, she most likely would not have had a very successful career. After all, she was competing against many learned men whose intellectual authority was much greater than hers. So why was she so appreciated by her noble patrons? The answer gets us to something that is often overlooked by literature specialists. What made Christine de Pizan extraordinary was not only what she wrote, but how she presented her texts. Christine engaged, entertained, flattered, and instructed her noble patrons by making sure that her texts appeared in some of the most sumptuous and authoritative looking manuscripts of the late Middle Ages. In other words, it is not enough to study what Christine wrote. To truly appreciate her talents and her influence, we must look at what she wrote in the material context of the books she oversaw. For Christine, text and book were part of a single project, a single creation. She understood that reading and learning were activities that are simultaneously intellectual and corporeal, that they engage the mind and the senses. Christine also understood what any corporate presenter, motivational speaker, or teacher understands, that how you present information has an immense impact on the reception of your message and on how you yourself are perceived. So with this idea about presentation in mind, I wanted to give you a sense of what it is like to look at a manuscript whose production was overseen by Christine. It is doubtful that any of the manuscripts we have today of her work were written by Christine herself. She had other people copy and illustrate her works, collaborating with different scribes and different workshops of illuminators for the simple reason that she had to in order to maintain the level and quality of production that she sought. Now, last September, I had the great good fortune to spend a day with a Christine manuscript in the Royal Library in The Hague. A note in this book tells us that it was given to John, Duke of Berry, by Christine in March 1403. The note reads, this book was made, composed, and compiled by a lady named Christine, and she gave it to John, son of the King of France, Duke of Berry, and of Auvergne, Count, etc., in the month of March 1403. So here again we see Christine cultivating a powerful patron, the same man to whom we saw her giving the letter from Otea earlier. The manuscript in The Hague contains the Livre de la Mutation de Fortune, the Book of Fortune's Transformation, a text in which Christine recounts how she resided in the castle of the goddess Fortune, another allegorical text then, where she witnessed how fortune rules the world by constantly changing the fates and conditions of individuals, cities, and nations. On the slide, you see the first folio of text in this manuscript. Now, what do you think this is? You open the manuscript, this is what you see. What does it look like? It's exactly right. Very good. It's a table of contents, OK? And another question is, what do you notice about its layout and design? Be like art historians here. What do you see? Just describe what you see. Two columns. Two columns. Very good. Which was standard for vernacular book production going back to the 13th century in Paris. Two colors. Two colors. Exactly. You, you see uh, alternating colors around the gilded initials. Do you all see the gilded initials there? Do you see how they alternate between red and blue? Isn't that lovely? Done on purpose. Subtle. But that gives you the sense of rhythm of moving through text. You see the gilded initials, of course. You see the space between the text, the text blocks. You see the use of red, rubrication, OK? Now, I want to point to the space in particular in the margins. This is really important. This is fine parchment. The Middle Ages is a dearth society. It's a dearth economy. When you see a book that is laid out like this with a lot of creamy parchment that is just empty for you to gaze at, this is a sign of wealth. This is luxury display on the part of the owner or patron of the manuscript. Okay. Here is a detail of the opening rubric. And the rubric reads, here begins the table of the rubrics of this volume called The Book of Fortune's Transformation, made and completed the eighth day of November in the year of grace 1403. 
And the said book is divided into seven parts. The first part speaks of the person who compiled the book and of his or her adventures. In French, it's just ses aventures. We don't know that's masculine or feminine. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Now, what do you notice about this rubric? The rubric is crucial to establishing the value, the believability, and the authority of this work. It gives the work a distinct identity and subject, gives it a title. It fixes the work in time, it gives a date. And it ties the work to a single individual whose experience guarantees the work's authenticity. Back to this page. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see that the book is divided into seven parts and that we have the opening rubric plus six initials, then a break. First part, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and then we have a rubric that announces the chapter headings of the first part, which is mentioned up here. Seven, of course, is a highly symbolic number. This book's structure is promising. Moreover, this foil looks textually serious. Tables of contents were rare in vernacular books and were generally associated with university books. So from the first page of text, we sense we are in the hands of a serious author, indeed in the hands of an intellectual authority who knows what he or she is doing. And the fine facture of the manuscript suggests that the contents of the book are valuable that they were worth the time, the effort, and the expense put into making this object. You can see in this slide that this attention to beautiful textual layout continues throughout the manuscript. So I didn't want you to think that it's just at the opening that we see this exquisite facture. It's throughout the book. And here you can see again the gilt initials, the alternating colors around them, and the use of rubrication and the lovely spacing. Now, notice that thus far, we do not know who the author of this work is. The opening rubric and table of contents do not give us a name. If we are medieval readers, our assumption is that this work was produced by a man. It is therefore striking to turn to the opening page of the text and see a woman. Note again the sumptuousness of this page, by the way. Who is this person? How do we know? How is she dressed? Where is she? What is she doing? Let's get a detail. So who is this? This is Christine. How is she dressed? Modestly, but as an aristocrat, dressed well. We know this from the long sleeves in particular. This is an excess of material, so she's showing wealth. She's seated at a covered writing desk. She is writing in a book, and she is in a somewhat jumbled building. Right? The perspective's kind of off in this. But nonetheless, what that architecture signifies is, again, wealth, nobility, status. So this person is clearly not just a simple scribe. She is dressed in fine but not extravagant aristocratic garb. She is seated in a heavy chair. She's writing on a cloth-covered desk. The architecture around her suggests a space of wealth and power, not a humble workshop. So this image is a claim to social status and equally important to intellectual authority. This woman has the learning and the industriousness to write her own book. It is important to realize here that an image such as this one conveyed a powerful sense of virtue. It is a medieval commonplace that to avoid vice and cultivate virtue, one should study and write. The image, therefore, declares the superior ethics of this writer. Every element of this image, in other words, is designed to make us trust in the authority of the writer and in the intellectual and ethical value of the work. This image of Christine at her writing desk brings me to the final part of this presentation. In many ways, up to this point, I have not emphasized the theme of this lecture series. <clears throat> and uh, I've also not emphasized what for most readers is the most important facet of Christine's career, that she was a woman. I have not done so in part because, as I hope to have shown, Christine was defined by much more than her gender. Indeed, she in many ways transcended her gender, a fact of which she was well aware. As she says in the book of Fortune's Transformation, after her husband died, Fortune transformed her, transformed her, Christine, from a woman into a man, that is, into her family's breadwinner and into a public figure. 
Nonetheless, I want to conclude with a brief reflection on what being a woman meant to Christine and on why she is the perfect figure with which to launch this lecture series. Here is another famous presentation image from a collection of Christine's work that she offered that didn't go, there we go. That she offered to Queen Isabeau of Bavaria, wife of King Charles VI of France, as a New Year's gift in 1414. Note that in the previous presentation scene, Christine was in a masculine and public space. Here she is in a domestic and feminine space. In this diversity, we begin to get a sense of how savvy, intelligent, connected, confident, and industrious Christine was. Yes, she was a woman. Yes, she was non-noble. Yes, she was a widow. And because of this, there were very few options open to her. Marriage, a convent, or a third, riskier path, that of letters. She pursued this path doggedly, unabashedly, and with an energy that is still impressive. In the work for which Christine is most famous today, the Book of the City of Ladies, we see that she was under no illusions about her social status or the challenges she faced. The City of Ladies is one of the most astute and extensive analyses of misogyny ever written. I teach it often, and students are always amazed by how modern Christine's voice is. They are also amazed and often appalled by how little things have changed in 600 years. In the City of Ladies, Christine is visited by three allegorical and heavenly women, daughters of God, they say, reason, rectitude, and justice, who tell her to construct a city in which virtuous women will reside and where they will find protection. The city is, in fact, the text, which is a compilation of stories about exemplary women from all eras in history. In this famous miniature, we see Christine with her allegorical visitors on the left, and Christine and Lady Reason beginning to build the city on the right. Christine mounts her defense of women by attributing misogyny to male jealousy, ignorance, insecurity, and impotence, by multiplying the number of worthy female examples, and finally by invoking the virgin and female saints who prove that God does not disdain women and that women are, in fact, crucial to salvation. And I can't help but give you a sense of how, if you will, sassy, direct, tough Christine is. Here's Christine talking with reason about why men have attacked, why men have attacked women throughout the years. And here's what reason has to say. Other men have attacked women for other reasons. Such reproach has occurred to some men because of their vices, and others have been moved by the defects of their own bodies, others through pure jealousy, still others by the pleasure they derive in their own personalities from slander. Others, in order to show they have read many authors, base their own writings on what they have found in books and repeat what other writers have said and cite different authors. Those who attack women because of their own vices are men who spent their youths in dissolution and enjoyed the love of many different women, used deception in many of their encounters, and have grown old in their sins without repenting, and now regret their past follies and the dissolute life they led. But nature, which allows the will of the heart to put into effect what the powerful appetite desires, has grown cold in them. Therefore, they are pained when they see that their good times have now passed them by. And it seems to them that the young, who are now what they once were, are on top of the world. They do not know how to overcome their sadness except by attacking women, hoping to make women less attractive to other men. Everywhere one sees such old men speak obscenely and dishonestly, just as you can fully see with Matthiolus, who himself confesses that he was an impotent old man filled with desire. <laughs> you can thereby convincingly prove with this one example how what I tell you is true, and you can assuredly believe that it is the same with many others. <laughs> That's right, exactly. You go, girl. <laughs> this slide shows justice 
Christine, and famous ladies on the right in the doorway, welcoming the Virgin and Saints to the City of Ladies, now constructed. The City of Ladies is justly celebrated for many reasons, but I think that its most impressive aspect is how it joins a clear-eyed and rather bleak appraisal of women's position in society with absolute confidence in women's abilities and hope, if not belief, that their position might improve. If Christine's voice strikes us as modern, it is because she expressed a kind of subjectivity that has become the norm in modernity, that of the intelligent, perceptive, but disempowered individual who has come to knowledge through suffering, work, and will. The City of Ladies, like all historically great cries against injustice, is stripped of illusions, yet hopeful for the future. And ultimately, the source of Christine's hope was not God or human goodwill, but a simple belief that, quote, a woman with a mind is fit for all tasks. Thank you. There is a translation of uh, portions of, you know what, let me just get this for you. I will show this to you. I, I brought some works by Christine if anybody was interested in coming up and looking after we finish. Um, there is a uh, collection of excerpts, the selected writings of Christine de Pizan. Um, and some of these translations are based on dissertations that are as yet unpublished. So this is really the standard reference in English for Christine right now, along with the complete uh, book of the City of Ladies. That's really what we have for teaching her, for example. In English, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yes? What, was, what were some of the primary modes of persecution or attack on women? Was it rape and, and laws and other uh, activity? Any particular things that stick out as being primary? Well, um, I suppose that there are a number of ways to answer that question. Um, let, me, let me answer that this way. Through the eyes of Christine, right, what she sees is a society in which male intellectual authorities are drawing on a hundred years long tradition of misogyny, of saying that men are uh, endowed by God with greater virtues and greater abilities and that women are meant to be inferior, that that is God's divine plan, right? Now, what follows from that attitude, which is really at the basic, at the basis of the Abrahamic faiths, right? I mean, this is common to Judaism, Christianity, and, and Islam. Um, is all kinds of mistreatment, or, or what we would perceive in the modern West as mistreatment, right? So yes, yeah, so not, not rape is policy, but the idea that uh, if a woman is raped, she has little recourse socially or legally, right? The fact that women are expected to stay at home, the fact that women don't have the right to an education, uh, on and on, right? Um, but what Christine does, what's extraordinary about the book of the City of Ladies is, she goes back through history and she finds all of these examples of ways, first of all, in which all of these male authorities contradict themselves. So she undermines their very legitimacy from the inside. And then she goes through numerous works. I mean, she clearly had access to a great library and most likely herself had a, a, an extensive library. Or else she had um, several fora legia, that's to say compilations of famous classical works and chronicles and such. And she goes through that, these books and she finds examples of famous women, moral exemplars from the past. And one of the great things about the Book of the City of Ladies is how she rewrites some of these lives. So for example, Semiramis, uh, Queen of Babylon, who has an incestuous relationship with her son. Everybody knows about this in the Middle Ages. Christine can't dodge the incest. So what does she say? She says, well, Semiramis did this before there were laws against incest. Oh, OK. Well, that, that, that's easy. And she did it also to keep the uh, throne within her own family, within her own lineage. So it was actually honorable what she did because she didn't want to lose the throne. She didn't want to give up the throne. So she does this throughout this text. She uh, puts this different spin on some of the stories that could be read negatively. It's extraordinary. And, and that is a true rewriting of history. I mean, that is one of the best examples in her whole uh, oeuvre of the way that she rewrites history. Yeah. Sir? Um, in her own time, I mean, I can understand that the, the book of the city of 
ladies would be very, you know, I mean, it's fascinating today. In her own time, what is the, is it, is that the book that people knew her most for in the Middle Ages? Or is it this history of uh, King Charles V? Um, she was known after that biography of Charles V came out for all of the major works subsequently. The Book of the City of Ladies was not, let's say, more famous than other works like Fortune's Transformation or the Book of Peace. She wrote a book actually on chivalry that uh, is extraordinarily interesting and that was clearly read by you know, dukes and kings. Um, the uh, book on chivalry uh, actually was probably more famous than the Book of the City of Ladies. Uh, we know this, for example, because there's a manuscript made for the Queen of England in the 1440s, and it's a compilation of various texts related to um, kingship and rule and military strategy, and uh, that's the text, uh, Christine's book on chivalry that is included in that compilation made for this queen. So um, I think it's fair to say that uh, there were other texts that were probably more known uh, more appreciated. We can also judge this by the number of manuscript copies that survive, of course, right? And there are more manuscript copies of others uh, of her works. Um, but then it, th that also gets to the question of who knew her, right? And it was a limited audience. This is the thing, right? I mean, she was writing for the absolute elite of Northwestern European society. It's not that this was out there being circulated for the people. That was not the case. Now, yes? Now these were all handwritten, so how many copies of each of these were produced? Because printing wasn't around until 1455 and after, so what do you think? So uh, we have numerous manuscripts, some of which, many of which were supervised by her, others of which were clearly made second, third, fourth hand. Um, I don't know the total number of her corpus, it's a very good question. Um, but um, it's in the scores, scores of manuscripts for her, her complete works. Well, just for the um, just for the epistle of Othea, there are 47 manuscripts, for example. That's a considerable number. That's a lot. Um, so clearly that was a very appreciated text, right? Um, and then uh, later on, she was clearly known by the literary elite of Europe. But as I said, um, she wasn't appreciated. She never became a canonical author. Her canonicity is really only after World War II. Yes, ma'am? In the period, um, that's a really good question. Uh, we can answer that indirectly by looking at the people for whom she made manuscripts, and judging by that, she was highly appreciated, highly valued. For example, uh, this manuscript, the Harley manuscript. Um, is a very thorough compilation of Christine's work. It isn't her entire oeuvre, but it's a lot of her major works, which she gave to the queen, which suggests that she anticipated that the queen was going to um, like this kind of a gift. Um, otherwise, uh, what we mainly know is what men thought of her, because she was involved in a debate, uh, the quarrel of the Romance of the Rose, this is known as. This is in the first decade of the 1400s. And Christine got involved in a very public exchange with um, one of the most famous uh, preachers of the 15th century, a guy named Jean Gerson, in which they discussed the representation of women in the Romance of the Rose. Um, this was quite daring, actually, for Christine. And this is one of the few times in medieval history we can really point to a woman who is taking on a role as a public intellectual. And that's really what this debate was about in many ways. Um, so we know from that exchange that there were people who were on her side, men who were on her side, and we know that there were men who were against her, uh, that she was ridiculed. Um, but this is what's extraordinary about Christine, is that we can imagine the kind of critiques and attacks and ridicule that she was subjected to, and she didn't stop. She just kept going. Right. Yeah, Bill, go ahead. Uh, um, you uh, focused a bit on the, on the sumptuousness of the manuscripts, and she would have to obtain for these, I suppose. Uh, to, be, to be presented. How much money did she make? That's the real question I have. How much, you said she made her living by writing. Do you know any, uh, how much money she was able to make through writing? No. I'm not aware of any uh, contracts that survive related to her manuscripts. That doesn't mean that there aren't any. Um, there may well be work on that. I'm just not familiar with it. Um, 
yes, well, perhaps she had to pay for it, or perhaps not. Because once she had a reputation, and she had the people that she worked with regularly, she could probably go to them and say, hey, you know, you know he's going to get this one right, so get ready. And they were probably very happy to put in the extra effort you know, to make these uh, extra sumptuous manuscripts, knowing who the audience was going to be. Can we move into the other room for re refreshments and conversation there? OK, thank you all very much.